that was a lot of polishing, and it still looks like poop. I either need to be a much better machinist, or throw this crappy steel in the bin, along with what's left of my self-respect. Hello Internet, my name is Quinn, and this is Blondie Hacks. Today I'm going to do one of those beginner videos that I wish had existed when I was first starting out. I'm going to talk about emery paper. What is this stuff? How do you buy it? How do you use it? It's a very interesting topic for hobbyists, especially because we have low budget equipment. Let's go. Emery paper or emery cloth is kind of a catch all term these days that refers to a whole family of abrasives that we use in the machine shop. If you're coming from a woodworker or DIY background, then you're probably thinking of sandpaper, right? You have ratty old sheets of this crap in drawers everywhere. So how is this different than emery paper and emery cloth that we talk about in the machine shop? Well, not that different as it turns out. But what about that word emery? Why is that used in machine shop contexts and nobody else uses that word? Well, emery is an actual rock composed primarily of aluminum oxide and that used to be ground up and glued to paper and used in machining. Nowadays, we use the term in a more general sense to refer to various types of wet or dry sandpaper and sanding cloths. The actual material is sometimes still aluminum oxide made through various means. It might still be from grinding up emery, but there's other ways they make it as well, or it might also be silicon carbide. But what about that word cloth? Woodworkers have sandpaper, sure, and we have emery paper, but nobody talks about sanding cloth. Well, emery paper is just what you'd expect. It's basically sandpaper. It's got a paper coating on the back and it's intended to be used wet or dry. And then emery cloth is the same stuff essentially, but on a textile backing. And the only difference is that this stuff is thicker and it's more durable against cutting oils and things like that. Does it matter which one you use? Not really. In the hobby shop, I think emery paper is a lot more useful. It's easier to work with in small sizes and it bends easier for working with, you know, really small radii, things like that. The cloth is very thick and heavy and uh, not as convenient. Uh, it is, however, nice that you can buy it in these rolls, uh, which makes it easy to cut long strips for using on the lathe. And you'll note I've got some chunks of Scotch-Brite here because Scotch-Brite is just another family of abrasives that we have these days. It comes in different colors, which are equivalent to different grits. Most places where you would use Scotch-Brite, you can also just use a fairly high grit emery paper, but Scotch-Brite is durable and uh, lasts a long time and uh, has a lots of different uses. But what about the grits? Woodworkers talk about this all the time. Oh, I used 80 grit sandpaper and then I used 220. But on YouTube machinist school, nobody ever talks about the grit. They just say, oh, I polished that up with some emery paper and job done, but I won't show you that on camera and so you won't learn anything about emery paper grits. The good news is in the hobby shop, you only need a couple. The big one is 320, or I also use 400 a lot, but they're basically the same. This is a really good general purpose grit. So if you're only gonna go buy one grit of emery paper, emery cloth, go buy yourself some 320. This is great for like bulk material removal on the lathe, and by bulk, I mean 10 thousandths, uh, but it's also great for polishing surfaces to a really nice finish. But what you also might wanna do is go on Amazon and buy one of those really cheap multi-packs of grits, and it'll come with everything from 400, all the way up to 3,000. And uh, recipe boxes are the perfect size to hold quarter sheets of emery paper. So you can just chop it up into convenient hobbyist sizes and store them in the recipe box. And these boxes even come with a little tab so you can sort it out. And this works well because the really high grits, like you know 1,000 plus, you need them very rarely. And so the cheap stuff doesn't wear out. But the 320 or the 400, you use it constantly. So buy a big pack of the good stuff, let's say Norton, hashtag not sponsored, but this is great stuff. And then you've got the big multi-pack for those few times when you need to really polish something really fine or you know do something with the really crazy high grit stuff. So the cheap variety pack of papers plus one good pack of nine by 11 Norton paper is basically all the emery paper needs for a hobbyist for a lifetime. And I'll link to all of these products down below, hashtag not sponsored. Now in the hobby shop, the lathe is really where emery paper shines. Wait for a laugh. Oh, I wasn't supposed to read that part. Wait, nobody's laughing. I just keep going. Because there's two things that hobby lathes are not very good at. Hitting dimensions and achieving good surface finishes. Emery paper gives us rank amateurs the ability to achieve both. And this is a chunk of particularly ornery garbage steel from the junk pile. Let's take a cut and see what happens.
As is typical with this tricky steel, the finish is, eh, not great. This is what you might call a five yard finish. It looks good from five yards away, but here on the Truth Teller macro lens, you can see the real story. You can clearly see all the tool marks here, and now I didn't use cutting fluid or make any attempt to do a nice finishing pass, but you get the idea. So let's bust out the cheater strip and see what we can do about this situation. The two things you need for this are ways covering. I'll throw a shop towel down there. Anytime you're using any kind of abrasive or stone-based tools on a lathe, you want to protect the ways because you're going to be showering grit from this process. You may not even see it, but there is grit coming off of it, and the grit on emery paper or any kind of abrasive is vastly, vastly harder than everything that your lathe is made of. So it's going to sit on there and become lapping paste over time, and it's going to wear down the fine finish on your ways and other precision surfaces. So always protect the machine from this operation. And we want to use cutting fluid as well because that helps keep the paper from getting clogged up. So keep it wet. When you're holding the emery paper, make sure that you're just holding it with fingertips. Don't wrap your hands up around it because this could get snagged by the chuck jaws or something else on the part and get pulled in. So make sure that you're just holding that lightly so that if anything goes wrong, it's just going to pull it out of your hands no problem. And one of the reasons I like emery paper is that it is quite weak, so if anything goes wrong, odds are the paper is just going to snap, which has happened to me lots. But that said, I still hold it with fingertips, and of course, keep your fingers well clear of the chuck because we're going to be working in a little bit close here. So definitely pay attention to what you're doing, which, I mean, is always good advice. So you want to keep it moving, and ideally your strip should be less than half the width of the part because otherwise you're going to be going back and forth over the center more than you're covering the ends, and you're going to reduce the diameter inconsistently. Now you'll know you're winning because as you go you can see that the oil turns black and you get this kind of lapping paste effectively that forms with the grit and the metal that's coming off there and the cutting oil. So let's wipe that off and see how we did. This is about 30 seconds of lapping with the 320 grit. You can see already, just after a few seconds, how much better that is. So what we've done is we've knocked down the worst of the tool marks, and some of the deeper ones are still visible, but it's much, much smoother to the touch now. Let me give you another look on the macro lens. So these tool marks are about half as deep now, so we're getting there, but let's do a little more. Here we are after a couple more minutes of the 320, and you can see that the finish is now very, very fine indeed. There's still a couple of deep tool marks, so, you know, we could keep going, uh, but you get into diminishing returns. The deeper the tool marks you're trying to get rid of, the longer this takes, because you're removing more and more material everywhere else just to get to the bottom of that little canyon right there. Now, that took a while, so obviously, if you were in a hurry, the best way to get a good surface finish is just to get a good surface finish in the first place. If you're constantly having to rescue lousy finishes, then you should probably look at how you're doing your machining in the first place. But the key to this really is patience. If you don't seem to get the results that you're expecting, just wait longer. Emery paper is very, very slow compared to other machining operations. But the good news is, unlike the woodworkers, we don't actually have to move our hands very much. We're just kind of standing here and letting the machine do the work. So. You know, put on a podcast and be patient. Don't be surprised if a really bad finish like I had here takes a couple of minutes of continuous emery paper to rescue it. If you want to know more about surface finishes and how to achieve them right off the tool, I've got a video on that subject, which I will link to below. Okay, but what about dimensions? All this polishing that we're doing, isn't that making the part smaller? Absolutely it is. Not very much, but it is. So if you are struggling to get a good finish as you're turning, Make sure that you leave yourself a thousandth, say, of extra diameter on there so that you can polish it down at the end without ending up under size. But speaking of dimensions, that is the other superpower of emery paper in the hobby shop. If you need to hit a really precise dimension, emery paper is how you can do it on very inexpensive equipment like this. Because the emery paper is so slow at removing the material, it allows you to sneak up on a very precision dimension in a very controlled way. So if you need to hit a dimension within a couple of tenths, then stop one thou large, and then just emery paper your way down. You'll end up with a great finish and a very precise dimension. And the other great thing is that the emery paper is very targeted. So if you have a very long part and you need a very consistent dimension all the way down the length of it, say it's part of a sliding mechanism, something like that, if you need to be within a few tenths, 
of the exact dimension all the way down, then what you can do is just sample that part with the micrometer in multiple places as you go. And then when you find an area that's a little bit too large, just hit that area with the emery paper for 10 or 15 seconds, check it again, keep checking all the way down, and you can bring the entire part down to dimension very evenly in a very controlled manner. It takes a little bit of patience, but with these techniques, you can get really high quality finishes and precise dimensions all the way down your part on very budget equipment. Now this is all 320 grit. What about the higher grits? Is it now time to come in with the thousand and improve this finish even further? The answer to that question is almost always no, for two reasons. First, 320 is almost certainly a much better finish than you really need on anything you're making in a hobby shop. You're not making metrology equipment here. And second, if you can still see tool marks from the previous grit, you're not ready for the next grit yet. You can still see these lines here that the 320 hasn't taken out yet. And these are places where these scratches are deeper than the surface. And each higher grit is slower than the grits below it. So it took me a couple of minutes to get to this point. If I now go to the thousand, it's just gonna go even slower now and I'm still not gonna get into these deeper tool marks. So keep going with the lower grit until you've got a perfect surface all the way across, until all of these tool marks are gone then you can use the 1000 to take out any marks left by the 320. If you need a better finish than the 320 in a hobby shop, well, you're making nicer things than I am. And I guess good for you. And the other big factor for success here is material. This is, as I said, some crappy garbage mild steel, and it just doesn't polish as well as other materials. So this really high polish finish here is tool steel, and this was also done with 320 grit. So. If you need a really good finish on a part, then you probably shouldn't be using mild steel. You wanna be looking at tool steel or 1144 also polishes very well, uh, 12L14 steel. So use something better than mild steel if you need to do better than this. And of course, all the soft stuff, aluminum, brass, bronze, copper, those all polish up very easily and very well. Now let's talk about emery paper on the bench, though not literally, because I don't recommend using it on your bench. You want a hard surface underneath the emery paper and something as flat as possible because otherwise you're just gonna introduce imperfections and curves into the part as you remove material. Now I know what you're thinking, flat and hard you say? Why I have just the thing for that. Surface plate. No, bad machinist, no cookie. Hey there viewer, real talk now. I'm Quinn, you're you, one on one, let's chat. We've all put emery paper on our surface plate. We don't like to talk about it, and we all know we shouldn't do it, but we've all done it. But try not to do it. The reason is simple, of course. Grit from the process gets between the paper and the surface plate, and just like the ways on your lathe, it's gonna grind down that plate. It's gonna put scratches in it. It's gonna compromise the flatness, and well, its whole raison d'etre is to be really, really flat. So don't make it unflat. So what we really need is some kind of a lapping surface. Now you can buy or make official lapping surfaces made of cast iron or various other things, or an inexpensive surface plate like I just showed is actually a decent option. If you can get one of those locally, they're not very expensive. The killer on them is the shipping. So a surface plate like that might not only cost 35 bucks, but it might cost $100 to ship it because they are obscenely heavy. Conversely, if you have a countertop installer nearby, go ask them for some scraps of granite. Those granite countertops are not surface plate flat, but they are very flat, certainly flat enough for lapping in a hobby shop. Barring all of that, the classic low budget lapping surface is a piece of glass from a picture frame. Again, this is very hard and these are very flat. And then you can easily tape your emery paper down to it. Bob's your uncle, low budget lapping surface. You know how this stuff is sometimes called wet or dry sandpaper? Why do you suppose that is? Think about that, I'll give you a minute. It's because it can be used both wet and dry. On the lathe, it makes more sense, I think, to just use it wet because you're trying to keep the paper from clogging. The lathe is moving the material very quickly under the paper, and you also don't have much surface area to work on in the lathe. The part is spinning in a small area, so you wanna keep that area clear. So that's where the wet part comes in, but this stuff works quicker if it's dry. The rule of thumb is that applying cutting oil roughly halves the grit. So this 320 grit becomes five or 600 grit 
when you add the oil to it. So I'll do some work on this piece of brass here. This was machined, but it was machined a very long time ago and it's been sitting in the drawer tarnishing ever since. So we'll start out dry to make some progress very quickly and you'll see what happens. A few things to note there. First, you can see how quickly the paper clogs up if it's dry, the brass really shows that. And you can also see that the center of this part was ever so slightly dished, which is typical for parts that have been faced off the end. Lathes tend to dish them very, very, very slightly. It helps make sure that they are flat when rested against other surfaces. And you can see how quickly we've removed material from the outside there where the part was touching. The other thing you may have noticed was that I was moving in a figure eight pattern. That's a helpful technique to keep the part flat on the surface. If you just try to go back and forth or in circles, the part tends to rock as you go and you end up rounding off corners or affecting the flatness of the surface that you're lapping. So by going in a figure eight, you're constantly changing direction and the part tends to stay flat. Now this takes a little bit of practice to do this quickly. So, you know, don't be surprised if you're a little bit slower doing it this way at first than going back and forth. This is tempting because it feels fast, but you will mess up the part if you're not careful doing it that way. So the figure eight is good practice. Now you can also see that I got a lot of scratch marks in there and that's because we're using it dry at the full grit as it were. So I'll use it over here wet now to see how that does. So for liquid, really any light viscosity oil is fine because all, the, all that the liquid is doing is keeping the grit floating up on the surface of the paper and keeping it from getting embedded like that. So WD-40 works great, regular cutting oil, whatever you have lying around. This is WD-40. And don't be stingy with it. As on the lathe, you can see the sludge that's forming a lapping paste effectively as the grit and the metal and the oil all mix together. That's how you know you're winning. You can also see how the material floats on the oil and doesn't get embedded nearly as quickly in the paper. So already we've started to remove the scratch marks that we put in using it dry. So let's do a little bit more of this. So we've removed a fair amount of material there now, but we've got the scratch marks in there still. They're finer now that we've used the oil, but there are still scratch marks there from the 320. Again, patience with this. Remember that the relative velocity of the material and the paper is much lower than it was on the lathe, and you feel it a lot more because your muscles are doing all the work. So you have to be 10 times as patient with emery paper on the bench as you do on the lathe. So here we are now. I also hit it for a minute on the 800 grit, and you can see that uh, it's very, very smooth to the touch. However, you can still see some visible scratches. And brass being so soft, that's not gonna go away with these grits. Now this is not a video on polishing. If you wanna go for that real mirror, then you gotta get into buffing wheels and polishing compounds and so on. But this is a very functional, smooth to the touch surface. Now that was a lot of work, right? Well, there is one kind of magic bullet in the surface finish department. That's the Scotch-Brite wheel. This is the EXL2S fine wheel. You definitely, I don't think, would want to go any more aggressive than this. These are sometimes called non-woven or deburring wheels. It's basically Scotch-Brite material, and it's also got like some kind of rubber or something or other impregnated in it. Maybe there's some polishing compound in it. I don't know. They're expensive, but they do a very, very nice job. You got to be a little careful with them because they are aggressive. You can easily remove material off of your surface and change the dimensions. So be very gentle with these guys. But they are a great way to look like a hero on YouTube. This surface here is unmachined. This is cold rolled mild steel. Let's see what the Scotch-Brite wheel can do with it. Yeah, look at that. This is the same garbage steel that I was machining earlier. And I mean, that finish is basically surface ground. That's how nice it looks. So yeah, these wheels are pretty impressive, but again, they are aggressive, so be careful. I wouldn't do it on any part where a dimension is critical because it's so easy to remove a lot of material with these things. But wait, there's more. Emery Paper has a couple other tricks it can do in the machine shop. 
One of them is to help you grip parts in a chuck. If you've got something like a casting, which has an irregular surface, it's often difficult to get a good grip on it because the rough surface means there's only a few points of contact between the part and the vise jaw. So what you can do is just tape some emery paper to one or both jaws, usually just the movable jaw because you probably still want the fixed reference to be precise. And now when you clamp that part in there, the emery paper is doing two things. The sandy surface on the paper is interlocking with the casting surface, providing more even contact, and then the paper itself is also compressing to take up imperfections in the surface. And you'll get a much better grip on that part just by doing that. And the tape isn't doing anything related to holding the part, it's just keeping the paper in place when you move the vice jaws. And then similarly on the lathe, a very common style of mandrel setup is like this, where you've got a mandrel to hold a part, and then you've got a threaded hole in the end, and then you want to use something like a flanged bolt or a washer and a bolt to hold that part in place. However, there isn't a lot of friction in there, and so this isn't going to have a whole lot of holding power against the cutting forces. So what you can do is just stick a little piece of emery paper in there, and now you can thread that in, clamp that against the part, and same as it was doing in the vise on the mill, that little bit of emery paper is compressing and providing a rough surface, and that's going to have much, much better holding. Alternatively, you can put your emery paper up against the part and just put a piece of scrap that has a valid center in there, into your live center and just apply pressure with the tailstock. And again, that emery paper combined with the pressure of the tailstock is going to hold that part nice and tight in your mandrel. If you look in the old books, this is how the old timers held pretty much anything small or flat on a mandrel in the lathe. Nowadays, super glue works in a lot of cases where this technique was used, but this is still extremely valid. So I hope this little summary of emery paper for beginners was helpful for you. And hey, maybe some of it was even right. If you like what I'm doing, throw me some love on Patreon. Thank you very much for watching, and I will see you next time.